I delight in our ongoing study of great doctrines of the Bible. I'm pleased you could make time in your schedule to be with us again today. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If you were with us last Sunday evening, you will know that we discussed the decrees of God, uh, what we could also call the plan of God, and a plan which we likened to an architect's drawings for a building that is to be constructed. And we offered by way of analogy this building. Before it was constructed over six years ago, the building in which we are sitting tonight existed only as a blueprint, as a construction plan, a plan that was then translated into reality by the actions of various construction workers, tradesmen, and the like. Well, as we said last week, in an analogous way, the plan of God, his eternal decisions as to the ultimate goal of history and as to the means of bringing that ultimate goal to fruition may be likened to an architectural plan as well. But it too was never merely a theoretical scheme. It was never meant to be just a theoretical scheme in the mind of God, but like the plans for this particular building was also always to be translated into reality, the reality of this building, and in God's case, uh, by the actions of God himself, the reality of the world in which we live. And so we want to turn to the actions of God for the remainder of our time this spring, beginning appropriately enough, it seems, with the work of God or the acts of God in creation. And there are several reasons. You may think, well, we know that God created the heavens and the earth. We get all that. But there are several reasons for giving careful attention to the study of the doctrine of creation particularly. And I want to highlight uh, four of those reasons. First, obviously, the Bible itself emphasizes God's creative work. That's the first doctrine mentioned in the Bible. It's the subject of the very first sentence in the Bible, in fact, as I'm sure you well know. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The very first words of Scripture. It's also an important part of the New Testament's teaching. In the Gospel of John, which is the most theologically oriented of the four Gospels, we have these words to begin it. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, uh, and He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So the Bible clearly emphasizes the creative work of God and brings it to our attention. Second, I would say this, throughout history... The doctrine of creation has been an integral part of the church's teaching, an important part of the church's teachings. In all of our doctrinal standards, creation is front and center, including in those doctrinal standards that are as brief as our creedal statements, meant to prepare converts to baptism originally, and which we now use in our worship services as affirmations of faith. And thus the Apostles' Creed begins with these words. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Similarly, the Nicene Creed begins in exactly the same way. I believe 
in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and visible, uh, invisible. So the church has always uh, emphasized the doctrine of creation in our doctrinal statements. A third reason to give careful attention to the study of the doctrine of creation is this. It has important ramifications with regard to our understanding of other important doctrines. It is foundational, if you will. The doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of the future life, of eternity in heaven, is, is really meaningless apart from the doctrine of creation. Now, we're going to return to this idea a bit later and flesh that out. But that's a third reason. And fourth, particularly in the era in which we are now living, in which so science and discussions about science dominate so much of our cultural conversation, another reason to give careful attention to the study of the doctrine of creation is, is that it is one point of potential dialogue between Christianity and modern science. Now, we shy away from that subject very often as Christians. We're going to talk about that. I argued with a school board in Los Angeles for two years over the science curriculum because it was a Christian school and they wanted to use textbooks that said absolutely nothing about evolution. And I thought that was a complete miscarriage of justice on our part. <laughs> How dare we prepare students to send them out into the world when they're going to be confronted with that theory uh, without being prepared to know what it is, what its weaknesses are. We're going to talk all about that. But this is a point of dialogue, can be a point of dialogue between Christianity and modern science. Now, true enough, theology and science run along parallel courses most of the time. Uh, but the origins of life on earth and the development of life on earth is one point when, when science and theology uh, encounter one another. They must encounter one another. And therefore, I think, as I told the school board in L.A., it is important for Christians especially. We should know the doctrine about doctrine. I should say doctrine. The theory of evolution better than the scientists do. We should know it. We should know what it says, what it teaches. Uh, and it's important for Christians to understand just what the Bible teaches regarding the subject of creation and what it doesn't say. And to understand precisely what is at stake in debates concerning the doctrine of creation to uh, science. Very well. Having spoken, I hope, to uh, its importance, I want to turn now to a discussion of the elements of the doctrine of creation, to that which exactly the Bible has to say regarding God's acts of creation. And the first specific point to be noted under this heading is to state that God created out of nothing. God created out of nothing, or to use the now familiar Latin terms, God created ex nihilo. Out of nothing. In other words, in creating the universe, the whole of what is, the whole of reality, God called what did not exist into being. Which means he didn't refashion something he found just lying about the universe. Or adapt something that already existed independently of him. He called it into existence. That's saying a lot. So let me give you the biblical evidence, because this is a biblical doctrine. The biblical evidence for the doctrine of creation ex nihilo, or out of nothing. Now, the Old Testament data is rather vague. But in the New Testament, we find several explicit expressions of this idea. One of them is found in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, where God says, let light shine out of darkness. Somebody give me the definition of darkness. The absence of light. The absence of light. 
So when God says, let light shine out of darkness, that at least suggests that the light did so without the use of any pre-existing material cause, right? <laughs> Ad darkness is the absence of light, and yet God called, uh, let light shine out of the darkness. Here's another passage from the New Testament which at least hints at the idea. It's from Hebrews 11.3, and we read this. The universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. What is seen, what we now can touch and feel, was not made out of things that are visible. That's another passage. But the most explicit statement in the New Testament, perhaps, is that from the pen of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans 4-7. Uh, and he says there that it is the very nature of God to call into existence the things that do not exist. There you have it. To call into existence the things that do not exist exists. So there you have it, as I say, God created all that is ex nihilo, out of nothing. But we go on now to note a second point regarding God's creative work, and namely that it is comprehensive or it is all inclusive is another way of saying that. And when we say that, this is what we mean. God did not create some parts of the universe while other parts are of some other origin. No, all of it is from God. As the Nicene Creed puts it, God is the maker of all things visible and invisible. I hope when we recite these creeds in our worship that you don't do so mindlessly because they are full of doctrine. They are very important statements. That's an important statement. God is the maker of all things, all inclusive. Whether you can see them, whether you cannot see them. And thus we read in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, that means he created the heavens and the earth. But that's not all that means. Because that phrase, the heavens and the earth is a Hebrew idiom, which means this, all that is. <laughs> it means all that is. Anything you can think of. That's what that phrase, the heavens and the earth, meant to the Hebrews. Anything that is, God created it. We use phrases sort of like that in East Texas, the whole shooting match, right? <laughs> that's, a, you know, it's not quite as fancy, but that's exactly what the Hebrews meant by that. Everything that is, that can be, God created created. And again, the Apostle John highlights the all-inclusive nature of God's creative activity in the prologue to his New Testament gospel, stating most emphatically, and in case you miss it, he states it positively and he states it negatively in verse 3 of that particular uh, chapter. And he says this, all things, all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made, right? Positive, negative. All things were made, in case you don't understand that, without him was not anything made that was made. Okay. So far then, we are given to understand that God created all that is out of nothing pre-existing. And to this, we need now to add a third point, which is that... Creation is revealed in Scripture to be the work of the triune God. Now, I spent an entire Sunday afternoon back in the fall discussing the Holy Trinity. It's such an, a crucial doctrine. But here it shows up again in this particular doctrine. Uh, scripture reveals creation to be work, uh, the work of the triune God with each part of the Holy Trinity, each person of the Holy Trinity taking part in it. Now, as we might expect in the Old Testament, in the pages of which the distinctions between the members of the Holy Trinity had not been fully revealed, acts of, of creation in the Old Testament 
are simply most often attributed to God, generic God. Now, we've already seen that this is the case in the Bible's first verse, Genesis 1.1. But we find similar attributions in passages such as Psalm 95, Jeremiah 10, 11 and 12, and Isaiah 37, 16. Here they are. They read this way. Psalm 95, 6, 5. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord Yahweh made the heavens. And then we read in Jeremiah. It is God who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. And finally, in Isaiah chapter 37, we read, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. So, in the Old Testament, it just states God created all that is. But when we pass to the New Testament, we begin to find finer distinctions being made. And for example, we read in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Paul is writing of Christians here, and he says this, For us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. Now here, both the Father and the Son are included in the act of creation, aren't they? And yet their roles are carefully distinguished. The Father is said to be the source from whom all things come, and the Son is the means or the active agent through whom the existence of all things come. And as we've already seen, John 1, 3 also affirms that the Son, the second person of the Trinity, acts as the agent of creation through whom all things come. Similarly, there are references in Scripture which seem to indicate that the Spirit of God is an active agent in creating as well. For instance, in Genesis 1-2, we read that the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. A very suggestive phrase. In Job, some of you just, I think, studied Job in Sunday school not that many months ago. Maybe you'll remember this statement by Elihu from Job 33-4 where he says, the Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. And then Israel's poet says to God in Psalm 104, verse 30, when you send forth your spirit, all the creatures of the earth are created. In these verses, the Holy Spirit is seen as an integral part of creation. So, very well. As regards the participation of the Holy Trinity in the act of creation, the biblical data seems to be this then. It was the Father who brought the created universe into being. But it was the Spirit and the Son who fashioned it, who carried out the details of the architectural plan, if you will, so that while all creation is from the Father, it is through the Son and the Holy Spirit. And if this concept boggles your mind a bit, or if this concept of the members of the triune Godhead each play distinctive roles in creation presents a challenge for you, consider again the construction of this building by way of analogy. Who caused this building to be? Who caused it to stand here today? Well, in one sense, it was the architect Mark Strong and his firm who designed it, who created the plans from which it was constructed. In another sense, it was the Kingham Construction Company 
who took it upon themselves to execute those architectural plans. In another sense, it was the various tradesmen and workers who did the manual labor necessary actually to build the edifice. And in still another sense, it was you, the congregation of this church, who authorized its construction, gave the money that financed it and made it possible. Each one, then, the architect, the contractor, the construction workers, the mortgage payers, each in his own unique way is the cause of this building. Take any of them out of the equation, and, and does this building sit here today? No, at least not as it stands. And so it is in the creation of the universe. An imperfect analogy, but I hope you get the point. Each person of the Godhead is each in his own way the cause of creation. And finally, under this heading, let us consider the purpose of God's creative acts. <clears throat> if, as we learned last fall, God is truly independent, and we said by that that God is all sufficient in and of Himself, He needs nothing from anyone or anything to complete Himself or to make Himself blessed or happy, then why in the world did He create the universe in the first place? Why did he do so? Well, while it is perfectly true that God did not have to create anything, it satisfies nothing, creation satisfies nothing lacking in the Godhead. Nevertheless, he did create for a good and holy purpose, and his creation fulfills that purpose. In that creation, all of creation, both the animate and inanimate parts of it glorify God by carrying out His will. That's the reason He created, to glorify Himself ultimately. As Millard Erickson has pointed out in his book, Christian Doctrine, this is strikingly illustrated in the Old Testament story of Jonah. I think it's a fascinating insight that I wanted to share with you. But think about it. If you've read that Old Testament story, and I know you have, everyone and everything in that account obeys God's will and does its part to fulfill God's plan for Nineveh. The storm did its part. The lots that were cast by the sailors did their part. The terrified sailors played their role. The great fish that swallowed up the reluctant prophet. The Ninevites, the east wind, the gourd, the worm. And yes, eventually, eventually, even Jonah himself. All of them obeyed God's will. Now to be sure, my friends, each part of creation obeys God in a different way. The inanimate creation such as the storm in the book of Jonah, it obeys God mechanically, obeying natural laws that govern the physical world. The animate creation, such as the great fish that swallowed up Jonah, obeys God instinctively and responses to instinctual impulses within. While only human beings like Jonah, or the angels, we'll get to them later this spring, are capable of obeying God consciously and willingly. And by so doing, are capable of glorifying God most fully. But all of creation, all of it, fulfills its divine purpose in that every part in its own way brings glory to God by obeying His will for it. Very well, to sum up then, with respect to the doctrine of creation, the Bible teaches that each person of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, acts in a distinctive way to create all that is, and in his acts of original creation, at any rate, did so out of nothing pre-existing to the glory of the same triune God.
and therefore to that God alone is due all glory and honor. Do you have any questions about this so far? Such good students. Yeah. Very good. Very good. So having observed the elements of the biblical doctrine of creation, what the Bible teaches about creation, I now want to turn to a consideration of a related question. What does it mean? What does it mean? We can spout out the data, right? I watched my favorite movie last night with April, The Paper Chase. Do you know that movie with uh, <laughs> Professor Kingsville at Harvard and his Harvard Law class? And the poor guy that was in the class who had a photographic memory and could remember everything on the page but didn't know what any of it meant. And he was caught in mean, well, that story ended up committing suicide. That's a different story. But what does it mean is always the question that we need to ask. What does it mean? In other words, when we talk about the doctrine of creation, what is by necessity being affirmed by that doctrine and what is, by, is being rejected when we say we believe in the doctrine of creation? So, or to put it this way, what are the theological ramifications of the doctrine of creation? Well, for one thing, as we've already talked about, by affirming the biblical doctrine of creation, we are saying that there is no ultimate reality other than God. In his work of original creation, as noted before, he did not work with pre-existing raw materials. Rather, he brought those very raw materials into existence. Therefore, God is truly the ultimate source of all that is. The ultimate source of all that is. Second, by affirming the biblical doctrine of creation, we are affirming that the original act of the divine creation was unique. And that again, it was a creation out of nothing. By contrast, all human acts of creation use materials already at hand. We like to think of the human person as creative, and we are within our own sphere. But our creation is always derivative. I'll use an example I use in my music appreciation classes. Take one of the great symphonies of Beethoven, for example. In one sense, those monuments of musical art are certainly creative acts, acts of creation. But unlike God, Beethoven created those masterpieces working within the limitations imposed upon him. The, the limitations of the medium he employed, for instance. The symphonic orchestra. There were just so many instruments available to him. And there were just so many kinds of instruments available to him in the 19th century. He was limited by the acoustical principles of sound. Moreover, Beethoven expressed his ideas using genres and forms that pre-existed him. He didn't invent the symphony. Now, he combined old elements into a new whole, to be sure, but the symphonic form, the symphonic genre, was not new with Beethoven. And in some ways, he was limited by his experience of, of what had preceded him. But by contrast, in the original acts of creation, God was not bound by anything external to him or pre-existing him. His only limitations were those of his own nature and the choices he made. Third, the doctrine of creation means that nothing is intrinsically evil. This is where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> Nothing is intrinsically evil. In Genesis 1.31, we read this summary statement regarding creation, don't we? And God saw everything that he had made, Lucifer included. And behold, it was very good. Everything was good. There was nothing evil. In God's original creation. 
In contrast, though, to this biblical doctrine, in all types of philosophical dualism, and you might not know what that means, but you know it when you hear it, there are people who make a moral distinction between so-called higher principles and lower principles. For example, some religious philosophies hold that while the human soul is good, the human body is intrinsically evil. And so salvation is talked about in those religions, in those systems, in terms of freeing the human soul from the prison house of the body. Have you ever heard things like that? Get rid of this old body and my soul will fly away. Oh, there you go. There's an example of philosophical dualism. Certainly not Christianity, but I bet you sung the song, I'll fly away somewhere. <laughs> Those lyrics are decidedly dualistic. Now, I hate to bring these kinds of things up because it makes people mad. I love that song. <laughs> well, I love Hotel California, but it's not a Christian song. <laughs> Listen to the lyrics of I'll fly away. Hear them for the first time. When the shadows of this life are gone, I'll fly away. Like a bird from prison bars has flown, I'll fly away. What's the prison house? The body. The idea is that when I die, my soul will fly off to heaven, leaving this old body, evil body behind. But if, as we read in Genesis 1, all of nature was created by God and pronounced good, then there's no inherent evil in material things, including this old prison house, including this old body. Hence, remember me saying a few moments ago that the doctrine of creation has important ramifications on other Christian doctrines, including eternal life? Here it is. Here it is. Because building on the biblical doctrine of creation, the Christian doctrine of last things is not our flaw away. The Christian doctrine of last things insists that redeemed man shall exist in eternity, not as a disembodied spirit, flown away from this evil material world, but as a glorified dichotomy of soul and body. Right? Our salvation is not complete until our body is redeemed, until it is made like our Savior's own precious body. And we will live body and soul on a renewed physical earth. That's the Christian doctrine of last things. Not, um, my soul is sitting away on a, on a cloud somewhere. Not at all. Jack Hicks asked me just before he died, knew he was dying. Randy, just tell me that heaven is not going to be, I'm, I cannot stand the thought of sitting around on a cloud for eternity. <laughs> I said, Jack, don't worry about it. You don't have to worry about it. That's not what we do, right? That's not our view of heaven. All right. Now that I've made you mad about it, I'll fly away. <laughs> Go ahead and sing it. I sing a lot of songs I don't agree with the theology of but think about it the next time you hear it. Isn't that what it says? But think about it. Is that the Christian hope? No, that's dualism. Christianity is something quite different. And the doctrine of creation plays a part in that. Now, several important subsidiary points follow from what I have just said. And I want to cite three implications of it. For one thing... The understanding that nothing in the material world is intrinsically evil restrains us from an unbiblical asceticism. Now let me tell you what I'm talking about here. There are people believing that the material world, including the human body, is inherently evil and that the spirit is of a higher moral nature some people, including some Christians, have been led to depreciate material things, including the human body, and to shun any type of physical satisfaction. As we said in our sermon this morning, think of some of the ascetic monks of the Middle Ages, for example. Or from a different religious system, consider the famous example of Mahatma Gandhi. 
who pursued meditation, ate a very austere diet, abstained from sex, all as preconditions of what he considered true spirituality. By contrast, though, Christianity is markedly different. The biblical doctrine of creation affirms that God made everything and pronounced everything good. And therefore, all things, even material things, are redeemable. True spirituality, then, is not to be discovered by fleeing from or avoiding the material realm, but by sanctifying it and by using it for God's glory. The understanding that nothing material is intrinsically evil also, secondly, guards us against depreciating the reality of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. This is a big deal. My friends, if the material world is viewed as inherently evil, then it is very difficult to see how the second person of the Holy Trinity really took on a human body, a human form, including a physical body. For that would mean Jesus was tainted with evil, with evil wouldn't it? Remember in the fall? Think back, we talked about those heresies which have manifested themselves from time to time in the history of the church. We talked about a few of them which deny that Christ had a physical body or taught that Christ only appeared to have a human body. They hold this position because they are of the opinion that the human body is intrinsically evil. And therefore our Savior could not have had a true flesh and blood body. He could not have participated in evil. But again, if we affirm the biblical doctrine of creation we're talking about tonight, we affirm that all that God made was good. And that allows us to affirm the full meaning of the incarnation, to believe what the Bible teaches, that Christ really did take on a full human nature and a full human body. So the doctrine of Christ is dependent on the doctrine of creation. Another implication which follows from the doctrine of creation's insistence that nothing material is inherently evil is that such a notion places a responsibility on us. It places it on us. If the material world is not inherently evil, then man cannot blame his sin on the evil world in which he has to live. On his environment. Why don't we hear that a lot today, right? People are what they are because of their environment. Because of what they have to grow up in. Because of the world they grow up in. This doctrine will not let us believe that. For human society was a part of what God made. It was contemplated in creation. And like everything else, it was created good. Therefore, to regard society itself as the cause of sin, which is so common today, is both misleading and completely irresponsible. Very well. We move on now to a fourth theological ramification of the doctrine of evil. It's on your screen there. All right, doc, uh, ramification of the doctrine of creation, I should say. The doctrine of creation excludes any type of dualism, as we've just talked about, but it also excludes that type of monism, and monism means one thing, which insists that there is no distinction at all between God and the physical world. And which regards the world and all that is in it simply as an outflow or an emanation from God's own nature. The end result of this type of thinking is pantheism. Everything is God, in other words. The belief that everything is God. Consequently, in this view, creation is not conceived of as a beginning, but simply as a change in status. The created world being conceived of as parts of God that have been separated from his essential essence, but still intrinsically evil. Pantheism is the idea that I go out there and I hug the tree. This tree is God, right? That chair is God. Everything is God. Everything is good. Right? 
By contrast, the biblical doctrine of creation holds that the individual elements of the universe are genuine creatures. You are not God. <laughs> I am not God. The tree in the yard is not God. <laughs> God is God. So the biblical doctrine is very clear about this. The individual elements of the universe are genuine creatures. They're distinct from God at all times. They're dependent on him, to be sure, but they're distinct from God at all times. Fifth, though the biblical doctrine of creation does not allow us to see all of nature as God... If all creation has been made by him, it does mean, this is another point, that there is an indissoluble connection among the various parts of creation, which is another very important theological ramification of the doctrine. What I mean is this, it means that all other human beings are related to me and I to them. They are in a very real sense my brothers and sisters. Because the same God created us, the same God watches over us. Moreover, since even inanimate material things also come from God, I am in an ultimate sin, sense one with nature. Since we belong to the same category, we're all under the same umbrella, we're all creations of God. And finally under this heading, let me note that a sixth ramification of the doctrine of creation is that it implicitly underscores the limitation of creaturehood. And what do I mean by that? It reaffirms the fact that no creature, as I said a moment ago, can ever be equated with God. No creature will ever be God. We're not now God, we shall never be God. Consequently, there is absolutely no rationale for idolatry, for worshiping any part of nature, or for reverence in human beings. <clears throat> to the contrary, the doctrine of creation helps explain God's explicit prohibition. In Exodus 20, you shall have no other gods besides me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. The doctrine of creation explains why. As the creator of all that is, God has the right to be jealous of his own glory, for he alone is worthy of it. Very well. I want now to turn to a consideration of the doctrine of creation's relationship to modern science. Now, this is a discussion which will take us into next week. In fact, it will consume all of our time next week. But as an introduction to the topic, I want to close tonight by examining a preliminary question, and that is this. Is there any real relationship possible between the biblical doctrine of creation and modern science? Is there any real relationship between the biblical doctrine of creation and modern science? To be sure, some Christians maintain that there is not. For instance, while living in Southern California, I had a very good Christian friend who is now a tenured professor at Utah State University. And he was very fond of saying that the Bible is most definitely not a science textbook. Of course he's right. But rather, he said, is a document whose message is purely and only religious. And which is therefore, the Bible he means, quite irrelevant to the discussion of any scientific matters. He was a scientist, and he wanted a clear demarcation between religion and and science. There's no relationship possible, he said. 
leave your religion at the church door. Don't take it into the laboratory. It has no place. On the other hand, some Christians believe that the Bible actually has a great deal to say about scientific matters, including the origin of the universe, life, the human race, and moreover, they say it's a pretty technical book. Very technical in the manner in which it discusses those matters. Who's correct? Neither, in my opinion. Neither is correct. It is very true, of course, that the Bible must be read and it must be understood in light of its overriding purpose. The purpose of the Bible, my professor friend is exactly right, the purpose of the Bible is not to give us scientific data. The purpose of the Bible is to show human beings, you and me, how to be saving related, savingly related to God through Jesus Christ. That's the whole point, right? Would we agree on that? Its primary purpose is therefore not to satisfy our intellectual curiosity, not to give us something to put on our charts and graphs, not to satisfy our questions about our origins or the nature of life or generally speaking, to reveal information that can be obtained otherwise, such as by a careful study of God's general revelation to us, a careful study of the created world. Therefore, when it speaks to matters of nature, the Bible does so not in the technical language of scientists. Those Christians who say it does are just, I don't know what book they're reading. The Bible does not talk to us in terms of nature, in scientific terminology. The Bible does so in the language of everyday life, doesn't it? Describing natural phenomena as they appear to the human eye, not in the technical language of the laboratory. All that is quite true, and we should admit that. However, on the other hand, just because a book it's not a formal treatise on a particular subject. That does not mean that it can say nothing at all relevant to or factual about that subject. For example, on my bookshelf at home, I have a volume entitled A History of Western Music, not Country and Western. <laughs> Western as in Western European. A History of Western Music. It is a standard textbook and has been for half a century on the historical development of the music of the Western world. But in its discussion of the church music of the 16th century, the 1500s, it includes historical, theological, and cultural information regarding the Protestant Reformation ignited by Martin Luther, and it includes information on the Counter-Reformation, which ensued within the Roman Catholic Church as a reaction to the Reformation. And it does all of that in order better to explain some of the features of the church music of that period. Why the church music is what it is in that period. Now to be sure, the book is not a treatise on church history. It's, it's not a treatise on theology or ecclesiology, but it still has some relevant, important, and very true things to say about those subjects. And therefore, though the Bible is quintessentially a religious text, it nevertheless, nevertheless does make some bold assertions regarding the natural world. And God's relationship to it, affirmations that have profound implications for science. Starting with its opening sentence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is at once a profoundly important religious affirmation. And an important statement regarding the origins of the universe at the same time. Which of course is a topic which specifically interests <coughs> scientists. So yes, 
it would seem that Christians must affirm that there is some relationship between the biblical doctrine of creation and modern science. And that is a subject that I'm very, very happy to be delving into next Sunday evening with you as we discuss the relationship between the biblical doctrine of creation and the theory of evolution particularly. I hope you can be with us. Let us pray. Father, we stand in awe of your majestic world. And Lord, though we cannot know all there is to know about our origins or the development of life on earth, we do know that behind it all, you stand as the creator of all that is. And so we are reminded that all glory and honor is due to you and to you alone. Lord, we learned last week that you have a plan for your creation, an ultimate goal to which it is moving, to which you are moving. And tonight I want to pay, uh, pray especially for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. Lord, we know that you have a plan for that nation, that somehow all of this fits into your plan for the world. Help us to have confidence in that and help us to do what we can to alleviate suffering where it exists. And Lord, I pray that you bring us back next week as we discuss how the biblical doctrine of creation relates to what you have allowed us to find through science, through the study of that creation. And we'll be sure to give all the glory to you through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.